uh, a once in a lifetime adventure. And I'm going to get started on Facebook Live under Cindy Paulus if you want to actually see what's happening, too. You're pretty good on Facebook Live, too, aren't you, Kathy? I, a little bit. You do it yeah. a lot. You do it a lot. Yeah. So um, I'm going to let Tom start talking about how this trip began uh, and how I know you love taking <laughs> trips to the mountains. I know that, Tom. But this was kind of a special trip um, because Lama Yeltsin and uh, Georgiana Cook made a point of uh, being a part of this trip. And it was a long trip um, all the way over there to Tibet and up to Mount Kailash at a very sacred time of the year. Right. So the, basically the trip started with uh, Georgiana calling me about, a was it a year ago or so, saying that she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So basically I said, well, when you're in remission or you're so-called cured, we'll go to Mount Kailash. And about, what, six or seven months ago, I got a call, and she says, I'm ready to go. So with that in mind, we planned the trip, and um, it became a reality. How do you plan? I mean, you're one of the best at this, Tom, but it, planning a trip like this is not like planning a trip to go to Europe. It's a, it's a little more involved. <laughs> and planning a trip like this, it does help because you knew some of the routes, and you've also been there so often. Uh, how many times have you been to Tibet now? At least four or five times to Tibet and over 12 times to Nepal. Wow. So it's been, it started in 1983, so it's, I have quite a history there. And a lot's changed since that time. Of course, I mean, everything's changing rapidly, but um, the reality of being on the Tibetan plateau and breathing the air and, and the difficulty getting there, that hasn't changed. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You know, you're not going to change that altitude easily. (laughs) A lot's happening under the earth and over the earth, but um, the altitude stays the same. And that's super a challenge. I remember that. I went in 1998 with uh, Georgiana and Tom (laughs) and Lama Tenzin. Correct. And this was kind of an interesting um, reflection back, too, because um, the last time you were in some of these places was with um, Lama Tenzin. I know that was the last time I think you were there, right, Georgiana? Yes, yeah. it was, yes. And and uh, and some of the places still exist, and it's been a while, so you went with Paul Horn, of course, on that trip to Tibet that time. Right, that was with, uh, again, to Mount Kailash, and that was my first time. That was approximately 10 years ago. So a lot of those memories, of course, started coming to light when I was uh, walking the Kora and, um, and thinking about Paul and so forth. And I'll just briefly say I got up to about 18,300 feet and magically this flute player, Zen type of flute player appeared. And I thought, well, this is kind of strange. And, uh, and I filmed him and I filmed him in 3D and it, he looked like uh, kind of, a, it was magical. I, <laughs> I can't even explain the words. It was so bright up there with the ice and, and the lighting that I couldn't even see the viewfinder on the camera. So I wasn't sure if I was really recording him and then if I were to talk about the story, would people even believe that here I'm thinking about Paul and his flute players up at 18,300 feet, right? It's sad. That is a very, very exper- magical experience. Right. Definitely, definitely But wonderful. luckily it all turned out, so I do have the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be a, a documentary to follow, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I was fortunate enough years ago to interview His Holiness the Dalai Lama and um, – Part of the interview talked about Kailash, so I'm hoping to bring those words to life with this new footage. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, you've done so many videos on this now. I'm trying to think of how many. It's been six, seven. On, how many have been involved in Tibet and Mount Kailash at this point? There have been at least, uh, there have been many times I've filmed, but uh, at least three or four that have been aired nationally on PBS. Mm-hmm. So I, I keep seeing it. I keep seeing things pop up on PBS and it's always interesting because I've seen all of your videos. Usually you'll do a special showing of them here right. at the Mac or you've done some the Illusion Destroyer, you did some of the EL but but it is different when you see when you're you're when you're seeing it on T V, you know, and right. uh, and also that's not in three D but it still looked really great, I have to say. I saw the Tibetan Illusion Destroyer just about a week and a half or two weeks ago. Right. In fact, when we were in Kathmandu, uh, I was able to screen the film there, and uh, the people from the Chiwang Monastery showed wow. up, along with the musicians. Wow. And, um, and, and it was received quite well, so I was very pleased with that. 
Oh, that must have been so great for them to see it, right? Yes. Yeah. Wow, so you had to find a theater? Or, and, and, but you didn't have your equipment or anything. Would you just run a DVD or something? Well, I actually went and uh, purchased the only 3D television in Kathmandu, <laughs> which uh, was quite a feat. Sorry. I can imagine you going out trying to explain right. you want a 3D a, TV was in Kathmandu. With, with Dorji Sherpa, <laughs> and we found it. And then uh, I donated it to the Chiwang Monastery. And, in fact, I just got an email recently that it arrived up at the monastery, which is up near Mount Everest, so the kids could <laughs> use it for educational purposes. <laughs> So, so it all worked I, out. I'm trying to imagine. <laughs> Can you imagine, Georgie, any of these kids up at that monastery trying to see 3D TV for the first time? Right. They'd have to have glasses, and they, I can't. I, I can't quite imagine what their faces would be like when they see the 3D. <laughs> uh, that that it's would be pretty something. amazing. It really. is pretty yeah. amazing. So, Georgiana, this was quite um, an uh, auspicious trip at one of the most um, special times of the year, right? The full moon of May has special significance. And we'll probably talk to Lama Gelson a little bit about that because it's considered um, a a special time for Buddhism. And Shakyamuni Buddha um, is celebrated and honored at at the full moon as well, right? Lama, go ahead. Oh, yes. It was in May because Sagadawa in Tibetan tradition, one of the most important holy time, especially when they do on that, just above the base camp near the Mount Kailash, they go to Darchen, they do a very remarkable festival, they rise a very historical, it was quite tall red flag, flag. pole, and then do other uh, rising on the string, thousands of hundreds of thousands of there are so many the devotees, prayer flags, prayer and flags and around whole the one side of the mountain is covered by prayer flags. It was so really? remarkable to really? witness, right? Wow. Okay. So I'm trying to um, imagine a whole side of a mountain covered in so prayer Lama flags. So Lama Geltsin, uh, he hung a lot of prayer flags that day from all of us from Maui and all of the people that were oh, on the trip. Oh, my. So our prayer flags with our family members' names or our individual prayers are flying this very moment at about 16,000 feet at the base of Mount Kailash. And they, they, um, they'll they stay for a year, you, oh know, if, you know, if they stay intact, if they don't disintegrate, because they change them every year. But Lama Geltsen and some of the Maui friends and uh, uh, put up the uh, put up the flags. That is yeah, so it was special. really special. It was very beautiful. Oh, yeah. that's I. Did you get that, Tom, on video? Uh, did yes, I did. Oh, how wonderful! Yeah. I want to see that. Well, you're actually going to plan to have um, a slideshow and show some of these um, slides. I guess Lama Gelson's a pretty good little picture taker there, <laughs> and you were <laughs> taking is. a lot of shots that we're going to be able to see. And you're working on trying to do something at the McCoy Theater later in July, correct? Yes, that's our first choice. It isn't c- confirmed yet, but we would like um, like to have a slideshow there or another appropriate venue on Maui and invite the public to come as a fundraiser to the center and also to show these really wonderful pictures of, uh, of Mount Kailash. And Tom said he would share some of his video footage too, integrate that into the show a little bit. Oh, nice. Yeah, so nice. we'll be announcing that um, in a timely manner. Did you take pictures too? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a long story. Okay. I don't know if we're going to get into you that didn't, story you didn't or lose not. Your phone or something? Did you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can we talk about those things? No one we, really <laughs> has an idea how difficult it is to trek thirty, what thirty three, thirty two miles up to eighteen thousand six hundred feet. I, w- I didn't go, you noticed. Yeah, and al- <laughs> along with uh, taking pictures or filming, it's quite a challenge. Yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, and I have to say, I didn't realize till I just talked to you today that other members of the uh, that other members of the Dharma Center came, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, friends and members of the center, uh, some of them came along as well. There were about 24 people in our group or more. I'm not sure. Tom knows the exact number, but it was close to that. And uh, the Dharma Center uh, friends and members were also a part of that wonderful group. So, Lama Gyeltsen, was this? Have you been to Mount Kailash before? This is first time in my oh, life. 
Oh my, so how wonderful. This is so, have you always wanted to go to Mount Kailash? Yes, I had the dream to go to Lhasa and see the, such a, one of the historical place, Potala Palace uh-huh. and the other temple. But these, uh, Mount Kailash trip was organized by the Dharma Center board members and of course the Tom. Wow. They all help it come together. It, it's so, it's a, it's a dream of a lifetime coming true. It is. Wow. You know, and it's a little different. We, I mean, I have to say, Tom, I remember back in 1998 when I was there, and I had an image in my mind of what Tibet looked like, right? And I kind of think I based it on the old images I'd see on the movies or when His Holiness was just escaping from the Potala. And and then I, we were pulling in. We did the long dirt road from Kathmandu. It took a few days overland. Mm-hmm. And then we were pulling, and you probably remember, and I was seeing um, all these buildings, and I was seeing some of the Chinese guards, and I'm going, this isn't like I pictured it. The first time I had to say, I was like, wow, this doesn't look like the old pictures of Tibet that I was thinking of. So it was quite, quite an awakening to realize that that Tibet that we kind of imagined from 30, 40 years ago, maybe 30 or 40, is, is now a different place, isn't it? Right. My first time in Lhasa was in 1987. And uh, compared, like you're saying, it's quite a different place. But I can honestly say I didn't see it all, as all being negative. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the infrastructure, the roads, and uh, the, even restoring the monasteries, I think, turned into something positive. Mm-hmm. Because, um, like Lama was saying, Sagadawa attracts hundreds of even thousands of people to Lhasa. And um, around the Jokong Temple, for example, I saw hundreds of people prostrating for the first time around, you know, the, uh, around, the, the, what is it? The main temple. Main, the temple. main temple. Jokong right. Temple, Jokong, yes. right. And, and, and without then, any fear of any kind of persecution from without the, any fear. the Chinese. And a, and a lot of them, believe it or not, were young Chinese people. Which really? Which was really surprising to me. Wow. So... In restoring the uh, monasteries, it appears to me that it's also attracting people back to the religion. That's very interesting. I do remember, and you probably remember too, Georgiana, when we went to some of the temples that had been restored even back 20 years ago, there were a lot of young monks, and they were so darling. Now they're probably grown up. They had mm-hmm. their, they <laughs> were reading the scriptures, and they were chanting, and they were studying, and some of them were like six and seven and eight years old, and there were nuns. Yes. Tibetan nuns. Yeah, you still see that to this day. We saw a lot of that young monks studying, and uh, and the, the the some of the monasteries being very high functioning as uh, as they would as they should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we saw a lot of that. But there's also the fact that um, they do know they're being watched. I mean, even though they're doing it, and that's why I'm even more impressed that they were fearless enough to go ahead and prostrate themselves and not be afraid. Um, of the situation. Uh, I, I don't know if it'll be okay with Lama Gelson, but there's a little interesting story. Uh, <laughs> Lama did not use the term Lama for himself, <laughs> and he was not wearing these robes, if you're on Facebook, that he was wearing. Uh, do you want to start the story out, and we'll ask Lama but what, what happened trying to get in and um, the kind of ed, um, rather adrenaline-filled moments when you're getting ready to try to get into Tibet? It was basically a roller coaster in terms of emotional roller coaster um, with the idea of Lama getting into Tibet. Um, In fact, we didn't get it approved until two hours before we were actually to catch the plane to Lhasa. So uh, it was about 8.30 in the morning. Lama and Dorji, our guide, went to the uh, Chinese embassy where he had to be uh, interviewed by the Chinese authorities. So uh, we thought... And what, what, what airport was that? Well, this was the air. We were still in Kathmandu, so we were trying to get to uh, Lhasa. Uh So, um, you know, the clock was ticking. Everyone was at the airport waiting for us, and we're wondering if we're going to be able to catch this plane or not. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, they pulled Lama into this room. We weren't allowed to accompany him, and I mean, basically interrogated him. So, I'll hand it over to him in terms of how he handled that. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) let's explain, Lama. You were not dressed in your robes. Uh, yes. When when you you did when you were there at the airport, yes, 
You're wearing street clothes? I wear aloha shirts. <laughs> and jeans. And he jeans. looked very youthful in his aloha Had shirt and jeans. Have you seen him in aloha shirts and jeans before? No, not really. <laughs> no. But, but let, me, let me premise okay. something else, too. Of course, we couldn't call him Lama, mm -hmm. so he came up with the name Tommy G. <laughs> So, so okay, he was, being, now, he was Tommy G at that moment in uh, time. Is this the alter ego you always thought you had of yourself <laughs> in a, a Aloha shirt, jeans, and calling yourself Tommy G? Is it, <laughs> where did you come up with Tommy G, Lama? Uh, because the name was chosen by the old group leaders. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> otherwise, everyone was going to call me Lama, La, or. It's not good to have that evidence. Yes. <laughs> to hear, you know. Yes. Yes. He, he had the interview with the Aloha shirts, and he pretended as a regular person. So that's how they let me go to Tibet. So, so, but you have your passport. So what did you do um, with the passport, which not... I don't think on your passport you're called Tommy G. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have to show your passport? Not the general people doesn't know what my real name is. Only the company knows oh. in my passport the real name is. There is a little involvement with the Tibetan name mm -hmm. as a monk. So that's oh, how they're, okay. they're cr critical about this name. So they, ca they brought you into a separate room away from anyone else. It was just you and the yes, person interviewing you. interviewing with the consulate. Okay, so as a lama who's practiced um, meditation for all, pretty much your life, right? Yes. I would love to hear how you keep your cool, Mr. Tommy G. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and don't get nervous when you have a, I heard he was a rather large guard or person interviewing you there in Kathmandu. What did you do to stay calm in this rather important interview? I keep it myself very positive because my intention was very pure to visit such a holy place in the Tibet as well. My family is from Tibet. So I enter in this like special room with the consulate. He go went page after page to all the questions. So I have to be really honest and careful. But he was really pointing out, oh, you doesn't look like a regular person. <laughs> and I said, oh, why? It's the same person, same human. So I thought, I just quiet. And he said, your hair is short. Your dress looks like very much yellow and red. And you, it doesn't look like. And why are you traveling? What is your interest? What the purpose? So I answered very quietly and uh, respectfully. So towards the end, the consulate was quite nice. He really uh, gave me complimentary that where I'm from because he liked in my aloha shirts. <laughs> and he said, oh, you're Did from... Did he know from Hawaii and Maui? he told me towards the end, oh, how long are you going to stay in Nepal? So maybe your visa is running out. So, and you're from Hawaii, very beautiful place. And he said, enjoy your trip. Wow. So was, uh, you think very positive. the fact that you were from Hawaii, do you think that helped get you through? Do you think it was easier because you were from Hawaii and that he liked, he knew of Hawaii? I think he knew about Hawaii very well, ah. especially at that time. The the huge world news was going about a big island. Oh, that's the right. Eruptions. Of course. That's yeah, right. Was so he was getting all the news. news. Right. I hadn't thought of that. Wow. Uh, did you do a big sigh of relief once <laughs> they let you said okay? <laughs> I was worried in my bag. I had this my like string, the prayer beads, and my <laughs> cell phone. All oh, they're going to go through my wallet. So what oh I'm my. going to do? Yeah, I emptied it usually very much my photograph. Or there's no any other llamas, the Dalai Lama's pictures in my wallet, even in the. Because you would have gotten phone. in trouble if you if, had a picture. Uh, yes, if I have any. Things in my bag will be trouble. Yeah. But they didn't go through in my bag. So but you were kind of blessed. I was very blessed. Because... It took a quite a bit long yeah. time. Yep. Actually, Lama would have been the only one not... If he didn't pass that interview, yeah. he would not have been able to go with the group because the group, were, we all passed mm -hmm. the um, the initial... Uh, applications for the permits and so forth. Only Lama was the one that was was singled out and questioned. So we prob I don't know what we would have done. We probably would have gone without him. Or well, that would have been his desire. Yeah, yeah. he right. It would. It was really tough. It yeah. was very very tough. So we had a big celebration at the airport <laughs> when Lama <laughs> showed up, and we I, knew he could go. 
Oh. Yeah, it was, re- it, was, it was really, really hard, really hard. When he walked out of the room, the Chinese guy was behind him. He had a big smile on oh. his face and he went. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and we were all, of course, relieved to see that and very pleased. Well, I remember way back when, when we went to Tibet, and there was this, uh, this hotel in Tibet called um, the Yak. Was it called the Yak Inn? Yak, the Yak Hotel. The Yak Hotel. At that time, it had a stuffed yak. Uh, right there in the courtyard, and I was asking you before we started here if it's still there, and, and the, the Yak Hotel 20 years later is still there, right? Yes, and in fact, we wanted to stay there because it's owned by Tibetans, and it's very close to the Jokong Temple, and, and uh, it's ideal place, really, to yeah. uh, be in Lhasa. And they had pretty good chais, I remember, right? Yeah, it, again, it's it's mo- fairly modern now. It's, it's Is it changed. Been modernized? The rooms are nice. They have te- TVs in the rooms. Oh for example, my! So. Well, well, I have to remember from way back then. We were told that possibly that we should be aware that we, that we could be on a camera and we could be videotaped, right. and that we had to be careful even in our room because I mean, obviously, they're watching. Sometimes, did you feel that same way? Now, is that still a, a consideration? Not to that degree, but. Uh, mm-hmm. With, you know, Lama Tenzin, it was certainly reality. And again, he had to dress in Western clothes, and uh, it was almost deja vu again, being with Lama Geltsin going into Tibet. So our guides, our uh, uh, the Kathmandu, the Nepal guides, to- told us not to refer to Lama Geltsin as Lama, mm-hmm. because we call him Lama La. Don't say that. Don't speak Tibetan. Don't bring oh, in not to speak. Yeah, Tibetan. don't speak Tibetan. So, oh. for for a while, the first few days, Lama was pretending like he didn't know Tibetan, and <laughs> and we weren't calling him Lama. And ex- of course, for those who don't know, Georgiana has been speaking Tibetan for thirty years. You've been speaking Tibetan as a translator. Yes. So I, of course, I I didn't. I was obeying the rules. Mm-hmm. Don't bring your cell phone because if you do, erase all the pictures oh of my. Lama on the cell phone. Oh so my. many of us didn't bring our cell phones oh, wow. because we couldn't, you know, we Take couldn't keep up with that, yeah. you know, with erasing all the pictures of him. Wow. So, but interestingly enough, Lama brought his cell phone. Oh my. <laughs> And his mala, <laughs> and then after a while, we it, it, it broke down, and we started calling him Lama, mm-hmm. and and then that <laughs> led to okay? that led to even some of the local people realizing where's the Lama? I hear you're saying Lama, so Lama had an opportunity uh-huh. to really connect with uh-huh. some of the local people along the way, and he. He gave them blessings and prayers and counseled them on certain um, aspects of their personal life. And they were just, you know, so grateful and so they were so touched. Well, that's that, really yeah, touching because that, he, that they, they could meet him and that they could receive his blessing. Because for people who don't know, I mean, obviously there are not the uh, amount of personal lamas available to talk to in Tibet as as there had been many, many years ago, and, and you have to be very careful, of course, of that. Yeah, we had this wonderful experience at uh, Mount Everest Base Camp at the Rungbuk Monastery where Lama literally went in and talked to the local um, monks and set up a blessing for us so our trip would be safe oh, at nice. uh, Mount Kailash. And it was one of the most serene uh, prayer sessions I've ever experienced. Well, and you could do that with the local monks, and at that point, you could speak Tibetan, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> and were they? And and was there kind of this feeling of a oneness, even though you're all the way here on Maui, and you haven't been? You were born in India, weren't you? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I was born. And you haven't been to Tibet before, but it must have been an amazing experience. Of course, you you know you were aware of Lama Tenzin and his treks and journeys. So was there kind of a bridging of consciousness of of that and what His Holiness went through? And did you feel some kind of threat of of, of being a part of that all? I felt very, first, uh, when I had prayers with the monks, I went really, make myself very uh, brave to go in the temple. And they recognized immediately, oh, this is unusual. He's doing prostrations and 
short hair and mm -hmm. <laughs> so they invited me to sit with them and uh, I didn't know what to talk the slowly they become to talk to speak how their situation is and how they live there and how much they care about their place and their practice and they're I can feel they're not completely uh, open or independently to talk and do mm -hmm. their own things but I feel their prayer presence was very strong. Mm -hmm. I really felt connected with them. And uh, I asked them, how do you survive here? And this is almost like 17,000 feet. And mm. they said they have no choice. They can't leave the place. They have to oh. stay for a whole year. Oh. They have to make a very special permit to go. There's so many checkpoints to go from, like, after three hours, they have another checkpoint. They need uh, so much p paper permit paper requires to them mm -hmm. to travel. So I feel uh, Len, the plateau, the Tibet, really connects something very deeply to me. I was been telling people, how you feel still? They said, been back now almost three weeks. I'm still dreaming. I didn't have really, I didn't read about, I didn't take any photos and think about, but still coming in the dream, there must be something connection is there. And I feel like uh, you mentioned that His Holiness 14 Dalai Lama, he must be have same feelings that he wanted to go back to Tibet and see you once in one more time before he depart from this world. And I know I witness in the Potala and near the Jokhang, one of the very famous temple, because I understand every single words of the Tibetan, and I just listen carefully what they praying, what they reciting, some prayers and mantra. Their prayer was same, every individual Tibetan people reciting. We are saying His Holiness 14 Dalai Lama, soon as soon possible, return one time back to Tibet. Oh. We want to see his face. Oh. It was really touching, and I feel wow. couldn't stop, drop the mm. tears from my eyes. And they weren't even afraid, because if someone had heard them saying that, they even praying that, could they get in trouble? If someone, if they heard, I heard the tour guide told us, very careful, the cameras are very obvious everywhere, yes. these yes. what's called CC cameras, mm -hmm. even the tour guide told us, there's even sensors. Mm -hmm. You have to be, care, be very careful what you're speaking. So I thought this Tibetan has a different accents. Maybe no one, not everyone will understand what the words are. But I hear every single word is, Galatinsing has to return soon back to own land. And in a way, through people like you and other spiritual progr programs and the monks, there is that uh, inner consciousness connection. I think you said the presence, uh, the word the spiritual presence. And, and I think that is interesting. And I know you've got a, a movie you're planning to do, uh, Tom. <laughs> you, get, you don't get through with one and you have the next one planned, but the next one you are going to plan to include some footage that hasn't been used that you got of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Right. Uh, when I had the inter uh, interviewed him a few years ago, we talked about China and preserving the Tibetan culture, Mount Kailash, and I, I said happiness. So now um, I'd like to bring those words to life with this new 3D footage, which is my goal. And have you found out if His Holiness has had a chance to see some of the videos you've done in Mount Kailash in, in Tibet? Has, have you ever found out if he got a chance to view any of that? Well, the last time I met with him, I, I gave him copies of some of my work, and he said he was going to watch it. But oh. again, I don't have that type of relationship to follow up. Well, there was a very special, special Lama um, that many people might have known here on Maui, and I had a chance to meet him a few times. And that, in fact, he was kind of key in bringing... Um, His Holiness here to, to Maui, Lama Dundrup, um, who uh, was here quite a long time, right, on Maui. But he was also very tied in and would go back to um, Dharamsala and, and worked um, very closely with His Holiness. And I just found out from Georgiana that he passed away um, while you were there in in. In, was it in, when you were in Tibet, in Mount Kailash? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. We were on our way to Mount Kailash when we got the news from our friends on Maui that he had passed away. And yes, he was a uh, he was a member. He was a monk of the Namgyal Monastery in Dharamsala, the monastery of His Holiness the Fourteenth Dalai Lama. Uh, so yes, he made several trips there, of course, and 
and would share the news of Maui and uh, and of his activities. And so, yes, he was very helpful when we invited His Holiness to come to uh, to Maui in 2007. He was here. So, yes, Lama Dundrup did help in a lot, in a big way on that visit. I believe and he was also very well schooled in Tibetan medicine. And um, didn't didn't he know some of the ways? I mean, because I know there was a lot of healing done on His Holiness as well, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'm not so familiar with that part of his studies, mm-hmm. but uh, but certainly that makes sense. Yeah, and and of course you have um, had quite a um, challenging year. I mean, anyone having to go through breast cancer as you did um, goes through so much. You know, um, spiritual practices are not. It, it it is a life changing event without a doubt. Did the idea of going to Mount Kailash as you talked to Tom about? Was that um, a goal that you felt was um, something that could keep you, um, your vision and your focus on um, getting well enough to do that? Did you find that helped out? Well, it certainly had, um, it did have, uh, I mixed that experience with my desire to go to Mount Kailash, but I have wanted to go to the Sacred Mountain all my adult life ever since I began studying Tibetan Buddhism. I've always wanted to visit Mount Kailash, and it just happened that that these things happened at the same time. I got sick, and actually, um, we tried to go in 2014, mm-hmm. and we uh, we we talked to Tom, of course, to help us get there in 2014. It was the year of the horse, a very auspicious year to go to Mount Kailash, but again, there were restrictions and. Uh, and the same restrictions on Tibetan names, the names of the Tibetans who were applying to go to China, to Tibet, if they had a Tibetan name, it was very hard for them to get a visa. So that issue already started in 2014. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't go because of that, because mm-hmm. uh, Lama Geltsen has a Tibetan name and some other Lamas that wanted to go with us also, their passports would would have their Tibetan names, so we we didn't pursue that trip, but then and then I got sick, and then it came up again that we could go, and uh, and so it was just I didn't want to miss the opportunity, and so yeah, it, it was a it was a um, it all was mixed together with my studies, with my beliefs, and my uh, my connection to Mount Kailash and. All of that having to do with wanting to go, and it was um, it was wonderful. It was perfect. You've served yeah. the Maui Dharma Center for how many years now? Um, I've been uh, associated with the Maui Dharma Center since 1982. Wow. So I don't know. I think that's maybe almost 40 wow. years. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of time to give towards this, and and during that time, never having gone to Mount Kailash. I have to ask how, uh, first I'll ask Lama and I'll ask you as well, um, what the feeling was when you got to that, because it's such a hard trek. How, you say it's 32 kilometers to get there, Tom? Miles. 32 no, miles. Around, to walk around. To walk mm-hmm. around it. And, and I but know Lama Gelson said something beautiful that he still <laughs> feels like he's had that. Do you, I mean, obviously there's something about a power spot like that and there is some energy do you feel that that there is some kind of change that actually happens when you when you're able to make and accomplish that and be there? Uh, yes, of course, it's an incredible feeling to uh, have completed the uh, Korwa and to to visit the mountain. It's just really a very beautiful, uh, very complete and fulfilling uh, feeling. But I have to say that the experience itself was very arduous, Mm -hmm. very challenging, and maybe the changes are on a more subtle level. I have to say that for myself. I Mm -hmm. don't know how others did because we all had our own experiences. There were 24 or 26 of us, and we all went for our reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, yes, of course, it's life changing. It was a it was a, a a it was a journey of a lifetime. I mean, that's kind of a cliche, but that's really what it was. And you know what? I think, Tom, you've seen this as well on some of your journeys. Um, it's like a pebble thrown in, in a, a pond. Um, 
you're there, but then things change and you even feel differently over time. And then I'm sure it's interesting seeing the footage back and and watching it later uh, from a different perspective of being there versus watching it later. Yeah, for me, it basically provided a quiet time in my life. And when you get up you know, to that altitude and, and, and you're in that scenery, and there was many times that I was alone too, that I wasn't with the group, it gives you, gives, gave me the time to reflect on what's really important in life and to get uh, centered in terms of my priorities and things like that. You know, it's interesting, too, because when you're in the present moment, as you have to be in part of that whole experience is, you know, being there now and, and you're doing your prayers or chanting and trying to be as present as you can be, but at the same time, you know, surviving, <laughs> surviving the arduousness of You're just of trying it. to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> Get but, some air. But you know what? That is part of the spiritual experience as well, isn't it? Because between the subject and the object and, and, and the beingness versus, you know, not beingness, when you're just really, whether you're in pain, whatever, when you're going through that alone, you, you can't help but really just be present without some thought, right? Right. <laughs> and that, and that, that's part of, I think, why you do hard treks is because in a pilgrimage, part of most pilgrimages are not easy. <laughs> most pilgrimages are kind of have, unless you're going to go to Eau Valley, that's a pretty easy pilgrimage. <laughs> we could, you could do that. But but most pilgrimages do have some of that aspect in it. I have to ask Lama, yes. when when you do a pilgrimage, and for you, this was a, an experience of a lifetime, do you do certain preparation for a pilgrimage? As you say, the other pilgrimage, like earlier you mentioned, going to the Europe or just going to the Eau Valley, <laughs> <laughs> this is totally different. I didn't have a really idea how high and how difficult the altitude is, but... I did uh, hear from some of my friends who went before, and they said it looked hard. So I took a you know, Haleakala over a month exercise, oh. in, like a practice, you know, uh-huh. many as much I can. So that it really helped me to go to walk there, but still very difficult because mm-hmm. the thin air. And uh, the difficult part was not enough sleep, and mm. there is no really thing to eat there. It's totally above the tree line there's very hard to find any greeneries and some protein so that made it very hard but it mentioned that some blessings or power or whatever call it energy it really pushed it really triggered to to accomplish this really difficult journey this pilgrimage mhm and and as you said you're still feeling Yes. You're still feeling the after effects, is that? The people mentioned that, oh, you're going to feel something, you're going to hallucinate, you get some kind of uh, awareness, but I didn't believe it. There's things I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> so I witnessed this time. I, there was a very hard place to sleep and not enough sleep, and there's nothing to eat or drink for three, four days. And really? Yeah, it was hard. Even they give some black teas or something you know they give a hard boiled a- eggs and we don't know where it's come from and <laughs> better just starve <laughs> <laughs> might might have been a wise choice in that, a, yeah that's yeah. a pilgrimage you good to do it this way so and i think all combination it made me really strong very energetic everyone is telling you you're strong and i honestly say my roommate was really sick and I was so worried how I'm going to make this trip. My roommate is coughing day and night all the time. And I had the kind of feelings that I, I might not able to make this trip. So along the way, I walked. So some angels came and like there's a Tibetan young girls. Like they're only 13, 14 years. And they tell me, how are you? I said, who you are in the middle of nowhere showing up. Yeah. And I said, oh, they said, can I help you to pull you? Uh, push oh. you. I said, no, I don't need it. They said, come on. And I came friend and say, what are you doing here? And you were just very teenager, 13, 14 years old and very good looking. I said, that's, they work. They're like uh, horse handlers and they were going to help their brothers and to g- get the final destinations. And I feel very touched and I feel other and is a little bit um, disappointed to 
their lives ending like this here. They don't have any education. They don't go able to go to school. What is their future? And I give it just advice and what to do. I told them this is not the time. You're a teenager. You have to be fun and enjoy your life. Not always being handler, taking care of tourists and hiking this high altitude. And they really took very deeply what I say to them with the very uh, my uh, feeling. And they're going to show up at the Dharma Center and <laughs> come stay with you now and, and have you take them out to the local bars so they and can we, have some fun. And, <laughs> <laughs> and many of our groups says, wish we take them with us back. Oh, they really yeah. touched. Many young teenagers are having really difficult in that area. Oh. That's how you feel about the people, too. The Tibetan people are so special and friendly and warm and so supportive. And there are other stories like Lama's. Uh, that we encountered along the way and how uh, w- how supported we were and how uh, welcome and in how it, we were just embraced. And it was just really a, an extraordinary experience. Well, and you know what? It is in ways you can't even imagine. And, Tom, after you've done it so many times, you've learned. Even though you've done it so many times, you never quite know. You're never quite sure because every trip is a life-changing and different experience than another one, right? Right, but my philosophy has always been just show up. <laughs> that's true. That's true. You say that in in the mountain calls? Right. That's, right. that's one of the things you say. And um, I didn't. <laughs> 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 and I, I'm kind of sorry, but I had some, I don't know if it was back issues or call soons and so it wouldn't have worked. And, and you know what? I mean, who knows? Who knows what or when? I mean, I know when you went with Paul Horn. I mean, he was, what, 70? 72. He was 72, and, and he had a very challenging time, and he had to take the yak right. up up towards the end and everything. But he was glad he went, you know, um, even though it was very, very tiring. And that trip we did back in Tibet, I mean, in 20 years ago, uh, was really challenging. And I thought I was going to die a couple of times. Mm-hmm. You know, magical things happened. Tell me about the temples, and, and we talked a little bit about the temples. Um, I remember way back when, when I did go, you did make a point of visiting some temples. And, and, and what was it like, and what temples did you get to visit in Tibet? Well, when we were in Lhasa, the uh, second day, the, or was it the first day we mm-hmm. arrived, we went right to the Patala Palace, which is, and we shouldn't do that because of the altitude, but because of our schedule being delayed one day, we were put in that position so there, here we are, we arrive, and what, two hours later, we're walking up the steps of the Patala Palace and, and touring, you know, the is palace. It, is it, has it changed in 20 years? When, well, again, I had the opportunity to record Paul Horn live in the Grand Assembly Hall, and which is, you know, uh, when I look back I think back the guards that, were on a lunch break or something at that one. Right. <laughs> but there was nothing in the Grand Assembly Hall. I remember. There. Now, yeah. to get in there, you have to go through a metal detector. It's like going oh, into really? an airport. There, was, there would be no way in the world that that could happen today. Wow. Because then yeah. it was like, a, you know, kind of a storage room or something. There were still things on the side and rugs rolled up and things like that. Well, it, it was uh, – I wouldn't go that far, but it was uh, – definitely wasn't furnished. Yeah. But um, – but a beautiful setting to record Paul because of the acoustics and, right. and, and so forth. But like I said, now uh, it's very strict, and um, there is no way that that could occur. And then the Jokong Temple we went to, and uh, again, that was uh, very similar. There were, again, because it was Sagadawa, hundreds or even a thousand uh, Tibetans there on pilgrimage, mm-hmm. prostrating and so forth. And then you guys went to the Sarah Monastery, right? You Where's wanna? that one? You want to talk a little That's bit? in Lhasa as well. Sarah Monastery is uh, one of the um, one of the major monasteries of ancient Tibet. And when we were there, they we went during the time they were debating in the courtyard, and mm. that was very interesting for all of us to witness the. I love uh, watching the, the mm-hmm. debates. They're very. In- they get very engaged mm-hmm. in debates. They sure do, did yeah. You, did yeah. You, you didn't get to debate, did you, Lama? <laughs> did you get to doing your hand clapping and debating? Over there, I have another story to tell you. <laughs> they left me in the hotel. Everyone left, so I couldn't make it that trip. But I went <laughs> out, what? and I talked to just with the Chinese taxi driver. says, I know a few Chinese words. says, take me this place. So I... Uh, 
it was towards the end of the debate. Otherwise, I'll be joined with them. <laughs> yeah. We're sorry, Lama. We <laughs> didn't <laughs> know that. How could you leave so Lama behind? We apologize. <laughs> well, it was Tommy G back then. Hey, Tommy G. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do a bus count, Tom? You know, any good tour director has to do the bus count. Well, no, you know, <laughs> no, I handed that over to Georgie Sherpa at that okay. point. <laughs> and, and then um, you left from Lhasa, and you went. Um, and and how did you get to the base of Kailash? Well, again, we were had we were all in a bus. And oh, we, you did uh, the bus there. So we and we went there, and also uh, to Shigatse, mm -hmm. and went to the monastery there, mm -hmm. Tashilumpo Monastery, mm -hmm. toward in, that. in Kailash. Or at the base of Kailash. Well, the, yeah, we went oh. there and then to Shigatse, mm -hmm. and that's where uh, um, Lama Tenson was mm -hmm. a child and, and mm -hmm. as oh, a really? small and monk. Oh, really? also Lama Dundrup also oh, is, a, wow. uh, is a monk at, uh, in Tibet at Tashi Lungbo Monastery. Wow. Yeah. And did you, you didn't know at that time Lama had passed away? I don't believe we knew on that day, no. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, of course, Lama Tenson's ashes as you show in one of your documentaries, were scattered uh, when you went to Mount Kailash. And that was 15, 20 years? How, 15 years ago you did that? How, when was that? Is that about oh, correct? Yeah. yeah. About 15 years ago. Yeah, and that was up at the 18,300-foot level, too. So that was quite special. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of a circle in a way. Besides being a circle around <laughs> Kailash, of course, which is a circle. It's well. like a mandala. <laughs> it's a circle within a circle. Um, but it is an interesting thing for you to be able to go back and knowing that, you know, Lama La's um, ashes are scattered there on that mountaintop and that, you know, you had been before and, and you made it, which is quite an accomplishment. And I have to really congratulate you, uh, Georgiana. Well, I think, well, thank you for that. But I think that many people um, can do this, this trek, can do this pilgrimage. They it is very daunting. It's very challenging when you hear about the stories. But I think people um, with with a with the right attitude and the determination, and no matter what kind of shape they're in, we've heard many stories of people with that are disabled or mm. can't um, can't really function a hundred percent, make the make the pilgrimage and do just fine. Mm. And I I just think that it's. Uh, you know, it, it has very much to do with the blessings, with the, the mountain itself, with the people of Tibet and ancient Tibet and all the masters that have gathered there and practiced there, and even the ones that are still there, that it all, you know, it all, uh, it all contributes to uh, the inspiration uh, to meet the mountain and to, and to make the journey. Well, we're just about out of time, but I feel very, very blessed to um, on this full moon day to be able to say Lama Tenzin, Lama Tenzin's presence kind of is joining us in a way, I feel. And Lama Gelson's learned to speak very good English. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, last time I talked to you, I didn't think you'd be able to speak without translation. So I have to say congratulations. It's really great to be able to hear you speak English. Uh, the Dharma Center is um, a, a wonderful place. You want to just tell people, I'm going to finish up the uh, Facebook Live. You can tell people how to come and join you at the Dharma Center? Yes, the Dharma Center is located uh, on uh, Baldwin Avenue, right between the post office, Paia Post Office, and Mana Foods. Uh, we have a 27-foot stupa, outdoor shrine, temple, pagoda. We call it a stupa in our tradition uh, as the landmark. Uh, and we have daily practice. We have... Uh, uh, we have weekly uh, teachings and community service, and everybody's welcome to come. And we have been there for really a long, long time. Yes, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, so please come by and say hello, and we can continue the dialogue there and absolutely sign and you up for the next trip to my And I'll let people know when you're going to do the video, the uh, yes. slideshow. Thank the you slideshow. for that. Yes, okay. and so we'll make some public announcements as well. And um, I just want to thank you, Kathy Takushi. People can reach you. Um, I know that you've been used, actually. You actually, I think, work with Lama Dundrup. Um, so if people want to reach you and want to do a pilgrimage of their own, they can call you at 244-1414. And um, also, there's just one one space left on the trip to Korea. Yeah. yeah. And there's the Paul Gauguin that new dates were added. So yes. you go to our website. 
Absolutely. And that that was one that Tom Vendetti got to do on, and it was a wonderful way. If you want to get away and just relax, as most of us all need to do sometimes. He needs that after that long trek. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that, That was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank you so much. It's really a treat to have you all here, and I really feel honored and and uh, blessed to be able to do this. And and until next week, we wish you all um, Tashi Delek. Tashi Delek. Tashi Delek. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs>